and we're glad that you could be with us. We're going to give just a minute here to get our sound and get it kind of a everything in order. Um, I ask you to share this with some of your family and friends. <coughs> Excuse me, if you can, we're going to get ready to start our message. So allow me to pull this up, start giving me some thumbs up if you can hear the music. And we've got a wonderful message for you today. Let me go over here. And get ready to see if we can. All right. Awesome. So let's get a couple thumbs up. We'll give a few people uh, a few moments to jump on here. If you can, get your Bibles out. And uh, we're real excited about what we want to share on today. I believe it's going to bless uh, a lot of us. Amen. So let's go here. All right. We've got a few folks jumping on. Praise the Lord. Can you guys hear that uh, Hear that music? Give me a thumbs up. A few folks coming on here. Let me see. This is, this is Jacqueline Jade. Good morning. Hello. Um, I'm going to begin to turn this music down just a little bit. And as we do that, we'll get started. Again, if you can share this with others, that'll be great. And let me see here. I'm going to turn this music down. I guess I'll just go ahead and kill it. All right. So, so glad that you could be with us. We're going to get ready here in just a second. We'll open up in prayer. And that'll give you time and some other time to jump on here this morning. And to be ready to um, share in God's word. We're so excited. Um, so as people are jumping on here, let's make sure we've got everything set. Looks like I've got it pulled up on the monitor. Good morning to everybody. As we're getting ready to study this morning's message, let's get everything situated. All righty. Well, my name is Scott Mendes, and I'm here this morning with Western Harvest Ministries. And, um, and we are a 501c3 outreach ministry here in Weatherford, Texas. We travel and speak wherever the Lord leads as far as youth and uh, rodeo forms and public forms. And so it's always exciting to be coming to you. We're coming to you this morning from my office here in Weatherford. And we do a weekly broadcast called Riding on Course. And it's just kind of a, a spinoff of the fact that we need to be riding on course with destiny and God's will for our life. So we're very excited uh, that you are with us here today. And as, as some folks jump on here, um, we've got our message ready. I want to open up in um, prayer as we get started this morning. It looks like everything's going good. One more time, let me get just a couple uh, thumbs up for the audio part of it. All right, we've got some folks jumping on here. Good morning, Mr. Kerry, Gail, everybody. So we're excited. Well, hey, Let's get into God's Word. I want to share with you a little bit this morning. My wife helps us with the camera. She's got all that set up. And as we get ready to go this morning, there are some prayer requests that we need to lift up. Um, each week we like to open in prayer. We'll have a time of 30 to 40 minutes of studying, and then we'll close in prayer. I want to encourage you real quick. Um, at the end of the broadcast, I'll give you uh, a little bit of insight of how to correspond with our ministry and uh, send in testimony, prayer requests, and so forth. But I'd like you to check out my speaking page, which is usayo.org. And that's through the FCA Cowboy chapter. You'll be able to see all the other speakers around the nation that we are so blessed to have friendships and work with in ministry. Everything from NFL to Feats of Strength, Power Team. We've got all kinds of guys that um, serve on the board and women the uh, WNBA Basketball Association. We have chaplains there. Uh, very exciting. So anyway, having said that, uh, this message this morning is going to impact us. So just get ready to buckle in and hold on. I'm excited about what God's given me and prepared for you, our partners and friends. If you're watching this for the first time, we love you. and We're so glad that you've tuned in this morning. Let's go before the Lord and lift up some prayer requests. Amen. Father, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus, Lord. This is the day that you have made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Father, no matter what we are up against, we have a promise through your word 
and through our covenant with you, Lord God, that as we seek you with all of our hearts, you can be found, Lord. Your word is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And Lord, you see the requests that come into this ministry. Father, from those that are impacted uh, with COVID-19, Lord God, uh, physically hurting, emotionally hurting, Father, addictions to alcohol, pornography, whatever the case may be, be Lord, there is so much that we are uh, just enslaved to and, and, and ensnared to, Father God. But we ask this morning that you will go over those families, Lord, that have these situations in their life. And Father, we pray right now that the power of your word, the power of your Holy Spirit, and by the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, would it would go into the to the viewers and to the listeners, Lord God, and it would not return back void, Lord, because you died for our sins, Lord. You also paid the penalty for sickness and, and, and the health that we need, Father God, over our body. So we renounce any kind of virus, any kind of ailments towards our body, Lord God, towards our finances, Lord, especially towards our mind, Lord God. You have not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And so we pray this morning, Father God, that as we press into you, Lord, we will find peace. We will find hope. We will be anointed for what you have called us to do and, and even the leading of our nation, Father God. We repent of the sins that we have allowed in this country, Father God. Let your remnant church, your true followers, Lord, not just Christians by label, but the true followers of Christ rise up. And take authority over this land and heal our bodies, Father God. Heal our minds. Heal our nation, Lord God, because we know, Lord, that you are worthy to be praised and can and will and desire to do this over your children's life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Praise God. Well, I'm very excited for you to be with us this morning. And uh, I know that this message this morning is really going to bless us. And so if you can, I want you to get your Bibles. Uh, I read one scripture uh, this week that really um, impacted what I wanted to be able to teach on, and that's found in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 3. Um, even though this is a really an in-depth teaching, um, the things that quicken my heart are the things that I want to share with you. And, and, and we have to go fast this morning because there are a lot of scriptures, and I believe in letting the scriptures, <coughs> excuse me, talk for themselves. And in doing that, um, we can have confirmation that God's word is true, pure, and undefiled. And so if you're coming to us this morning and you're here for the first time, I pray that we, this message will be a blessing for you. We have titled today's message, Deliverance from an Evil Age. Well, it doesn't take very long to live in this world to understand that we are living in an evil age without a doubt. Now, that doesn't mean that we need to be complacent or fearful of those things, and we need to be aware of those things. And if we are and we read God's word, we will know uh, what is going on. And half of winning a battle is knowing what you're fighting. And so again, the title of this message is Deliverance from an Evil Age. The scripture that I pulled this from this week is Galatians 1.3. Now, if you can't keep up, just maybe jot them down or go back and watch this broadcast throughout the day. We will upload it on some other platforms. And as you know, like any other teaching ministry, we are uh, very much censored. That's why we ask you to share this and to share this with your loved ones. Because in the knowledge of God's word, there is protection, there's provision, and there's, there's insight to how we are to live our life. So Galatians 1.3, let's read and I'll tell you how we titled this message. Uh, Galatians 1.3 says this, Grace to you and peace from God the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself of, uh, for our sins, that he may deliver us from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to, to whom be glory forever and ever. So I titled this message, Deliverance from an Evil Age. Now, in order for me to verify and to share this message in your life, we're going to look at 
some of Paul's times that he lived in. We're going to pull out some nuggets. We're going to read lots of scripture. So if nothing else, just turn off the picture, put your phone on speakerphone, and allow the Word of God to minister to you this morning. So just as an introductory, we look at the greetings uh, to the churches of Galatia, containing words of grace and peace from God the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. So we have to settle it in our hearts that God's Word is final and the most high authority over heaven and earth, and especially over our lives. Amen? So as an illustration of God's grace and of God's peace, we want to look at a couple things. And Paul continued to tell us that he, he who gave himself for our sins, see that's grace, unmerited favor. He gave our, his self for a purpose. He knew that we needed help with our sinful flesh. So that he might, now why did he do that? That his will is also, it goes on to say, that his will may deliver us from this present age. Well, we know back then as Paul was writing that, again, the church, the, the, the Bible would come into existence. The writings, the teachings of God's word uh, is for us today. That's why America was so blessed, is that people gave their life so that we could have the right to freely have God's word available to us, to teach it in our schools, to, to, to have a remembrance of what has happened. So it is so important that as we share this message this moment, this, mor this morning is to know that we are living in an evil age, but Paul's generation and times and culture were also evil. And that's why he wrote these letters of the New Testament to all these various churches and so forth. So let's go on. That he may deliver us from this present age. Amen. Undoubtedly, we have heard much about Jesus dying for our sins, but what about the idea of him delivering us from an evil age. So one of the ways that he can deliver us is that, that he doesn't just receive us all. We continue to live, but that if he's given redemption of our sins and we continue to live, he has a plan of deliverance which gives you and I the hope that we need to raise our families to live in the 21st century. Amen. God's word is the same yesterday and forever. It will not be changed. And if you believe it and apply it to your life, you shall be greatly blessed and equipped. So the idea of delivering us from an evil age is what I want to talk about. Um, but that kind of, but, you know, we, as we talk about that, the word age is translated here. And it means a period of time. And so in my notes, I write down here, today's evil world. Do you feel that today's world is different than it was a year ago? two years ago, or maybe 25 years ago, if you're elderly. Amen. Culture is changing. Technology is changing. Perversion of men is rampant on this earth. And as we see what's going on around us, we must educate ourselves very strongly into the purest form of the gospel and not allow false doctrine, false teaching, false hopes, and, and misleading to think humanistically that we can get something, and it's going to make everything go back to the way it was. This, this plays right into the hand of Satan. So we're talking continually about this evil age that we live in today. It is totally different, and it shall not go back to the way it was. So we have to realign, position ourselves, not with the science of the world, but with the facts of God's Word. And if you'll do that, you will be greatly, greatly blessed. So a period of time. Paul had in mind the present present period of his time his views of being evil look at this ephesians 5 6 says this redeeming the time because the days are evil that tells us if you're reading god's word that we should be wise with what we're doing we should not be complacent we should not be lethargic we should not be lawless we should not allow paradigms and mindsets coming through way of the media into our life to dictate our direction so another scripture that confirms this is Ephesians 6.13. And it simply says this, Therefore take up the whole armor of God, which we recently in past weeks have taught on, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. These scriptures verify to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, stand 
and stand therefore more. And so we see here that we are living in an evil age, but God's desire to deliver us came through what Jesus does on the cross. And we can be forgiven of our sins. And also this deliverance comes to us in different forms. And that's what this teaching is all about today. So the evil of this present age, do we take seriously the evil of this age? I'm telling you, it's more wicked today than it ever has been. And it's going upward in the evil category. Uh, do we appreciate the deliverance that Jesus has and, and Jesus has provided? Boy, I appreciate it. I don't know how you could live today without a relationship and a purity and a trust in all your heart and knowing the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Consider for a moment the evil in Paul's times. Paul describes the sin in those days in Romans chapter 1. Now, I elected not to uh, read and to pull from this, but I'm going to ask you in your own time. You go to Romans chapter 8. Uh, or excuse me, Romans 1, verses 18 through 32, and you will be able to see exactly the perversion of what was going on that Paul wrote about. We all know that, that man was given over to a debased mind. Uh, it talks about homosexuality. It talks about all kinds of wickedness of the flesh. And so I challenge you, to read Romans 1, verses 18 through 32. Now let's move on. That's again describing the evil times that Paul lived in. Um, in the present age against whom, now, now I'll, paraphr <coughs> excuse me, I'll paraphrase that for you. Some points that I pulled out of Romans uh, 1 without having to read all of it is that um, we see against whom the wrath of God is coming. So when we partake in unrighteousness the wrath of God will come upon you so we have to identify how we got into the situation of life that we need deliverance from if we keep going down that same road playing religion being involved in these secret societies allowing science to direct our health allowing science to do things that are just humanistic and secular secularism those things can lead us into a pit and farthest from the gospel. So I'm asking you, it says here in Romans 1, that against whom the wrath of God is coming for, they denied the creator and they suppressed the truth. Well, that's censorship, even in Paul's time. They didn't want to hear the truth. Today in our modern churches, we have teachers that want to preach to itchy ears. They don't want to have a sense of the truth. They want to teach on pop culture. They want to say it's okay and use their sanctuary to bring you in to do worldly things, even, even in, 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 in physical health things. God's house is a place of prayer, not a den of thieves. And we should rise up and get mad, just like Jesus did in the temple, and turn over those tables and draw a place in the sand and say, as for me and my house, we will not allow this. So, uh, given up to their own vows and passions. We talked about that. I don't use that word a lot. Homosexuality, same-sex marriage abortion, all these things fall into dep depravity. And they are filled with all sorts of unrighteousness. Unrighteousness is doubt and belief and separation from God. But righteousness, true righteousness, comes from the gospel. So that is in Paul's age. Read Romans chapter 1. Uh, this evil of the present age uh, that we see right now, he also called sins the work of the flesh. Galatians 5, 19, 21 will, uh, will define what all those are. We preach on those a whole lot. So I'm just going to ask you again, go to Galatians chapter 5 and see what the works of the flesh are. Adultery, murder, uh, murder fornication, lust, uh, lawlessness, all those things are defined in Galatians 5. And when I was rodeoing and I saw myself and I had this kind of stuff in my environment around my life, the word of God set me free and talked to me. And it said, Scott, if you continue down this road, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. And I was raised under the admiration and the fear of the Lord. Even though we had challenging times in my childhood, I realized that I did not want to miss what I was created for. I believed that God had his hand on my life. And if I served the devil 
and I continue to walk in evil, wicked ways, thinking that I was okay through religion and by association of hanging out with famous people, whatever the case may be, uh, I was going to be led astray. So the works of the flesh is part of the evil age. Sins that are evident to those uh, not blinded by them, all unrepented sins will keep us out of heaven. So whatever you have partake to, take to, uh, partaken in, you need to renounce that. You need to claim it. You need to own that and say, I was wrong. I was outside of God's will. I not only uh, repent, but I turn 180 degrees the other way, and I depart from ever putting myself in those temptations or allowing that to be close to me. So unrepentant sins will keep you from receiving uh, the promise of heaven. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 says it this way. Do you not know that those who uh, those know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Again, 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Uh, let me read that again. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators or idolaters, uh, idolaters or adulterers or homosexuals nor sodomists uh, nor thieves, nor covetousness, nor drunkards, nor rivals, nor exhorters will inherit the kingdom of God. Man, what? How, how much clearer could God leave a message in his word for us? Jesus is the word. Jesus is the Holy Spirit. They have offices. They have administration. They have delegation. They do certain things. And as we come to the Lord in his presence and we pray, we worship him. We get our hearts open. God reveals through his word a mirror to the affliction of a man's life. And we take it to heart or we reject it. And we continue in our perversion. We've all been there. None uh, is without sin. But God has paid the penalty of sin. And even beyond sin, he has a plan of deliverance. So I'm going to encourage you this morning that if you've ever felt hopeless or you don't understand why you go through a cycle of ruts, you get out, you go back in, you go back in. It's the chaotic strategy of the world and the elite people of this world. Psychologically, they are doing the same things over and over and hip, almost like hypnosis or hypnotic. Uh, I don't even know how you say that, putting us into a place of complacency. And through hypnosis, they have allowed us to be thinking that somebody else is going to fix it. But it's not going to be that way. The way we fix it is we fix it in our heart. Paul and the early Christians found themselves living in an evil time. What about evil in our day? We've got to define that. Today, uh, many think light, think light of such things as fornication, adultery, divorce, etc. We shouldn't do that. When we compromise the word of God, we welcome it in in the name of love, or we say that we all worship the same God, or that God came uh, uh, you know, for, for love, but then the scripture says it doesn't, uh, com it doesn't uh, contradict itself. It says that he came for a sword. Well, that sword is for the unbeliever, and it divides and it separates us. We have to be on the side of righteousness and believing in Lord and submitting to the Lord and not confusing the word of God. The devil is an accuser, and he will twist the word of God, and he knows the word of God, so you and I must know the word even better, and today we'll put it in our heart where they cannot censor it. Amen? I don't know who that's for, but I take that. So we cannot give light of abortion and same-sex marriage and all those things. More and more our culture is accepting lasciviousness, pornography, drug abuse. These things we cannot accept. If Jesus calls it sin, then it's sin, and we cannot water it down in the world. Amen? Today we find ourselves living in very evil times man i want to encourage us to get a grip and not to just give in to what the world is selling us to give us a false hope a false peace and, and and a false future you want to follow the way that the world is going you will end up in a bad situation so the deliverance of the lord the first point that i want to talk about is he delivers us from the guilt of sin sin is a transgression of god's law so when we depart from the law, we're in transgression and it leads to sin. Every sin that you've ever committed was in the, in the mind. 
You must first premeditate on it. You must first put your eyes upon it, reading it in a tabloid, reading it in a book, seeing it in a movie, and thinking, hey, if they can get away with it, I'm going to get away from it, get away with it as well. But let me tell you, you have to answer to God for every idle word. Every thought is a seed, and you want to produce a harvest, but yet you're planting a, 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 a bad harvest uh, in your life. So sin is a transgression. Now, some scriptures to verify that. 1 John 3 and verse 4 says this, whoever commits sin uh, also commits lawlessness. Can you imagine that we're talking about defunding our protection in these large cities? That is chaotic, but it plays into their hand because they already have the answer. They're trying to divide. We should unite. They're trying to live in darkness. We should live in light. They're trying to be behind elite uh, people and segregating people based on their uh, social scores or what they offer this world. God says that the first will be last and the last will be first. Everything in God's word is an upside down kingdom. But if you don't know that, you will play right into the hand of the world and the evil present age that we live in. So whoever commits sins commits lawlessness and sin is lawlessness. All have sin for which is the punishment of death. So when you sin, it leads to death. Not necessarily always physical death, but spiritual death. And there's a lot of people that are walking around in the physical body, but inside their soul, their mind, their will, and their emotion, they are physically dead. And no ouchy fauci is going to help you no, no matter what you're trying to position yourself into this group because they're the most popular group. They're selling what you believe that your flesh likes. You must bring your flesh under subjection and mortify it. Put it under control to the authority of God's word and his teaching. So I've got to go on. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So God's deliverance is from the guilt of sin. If you sin, you run to God, not from God. And the devil is a master at pulling your string. He is the ultimate puppeteer. And as you see what's going on over our nation, over our world, over the globalists, over the situations that they're selling, they've already made the answer. These things have all been played, and we're not going to play into that because we have the mind of Christ. We should know where we're at. So the deliverance of the Lord provides uh, the deliverance from the blood that frees us from the guilt of sin. If you're feeling guilt in your life for unconfessed sin, what you need to do is confess it. You need to name it so that you can replenish your heart. You pull that out and you put the things of God. If your heart is empty of God, you're going to have a lot of things of the world in your heart, which is the incubator that leads and, and directs your life. And so you should be so full of Christ and so meditated on God's word that there's no place for the world. And that will help you. So to be guilty, to free of guilt of sin, let's look at Ephesians 1 and verse 7. In him, we have redemption. It didn't say maybe. You, you might have redemption. It says in him, in Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Amen. That is good teaching to know that we have remission, redemption through his blood. Jesus did it all. We need to be in Jesus so that we can be free. So we receive remissions of our sins, you know, as we're baptized. A lot of people, I don't want to get bogged down right here. There are scriptures that I want to read. But a lot of times, it's not the baptism that, 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 that washes you of your sins. And that once you do that, you go back to living the way you were. Uh, you're filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, however, some people teach this uh, in, in, in an unbiblical way. I don't care when you get filled with the Holy Spirit. All I know is you need to get filled. Some will say, are you filled with it twice? Do you get it all at salvation? You know, I just want to be well balanced. And I want to tell you that the Holy Spirit is available for you in your life. If you're a Christian that knows the word, but you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you won't have the Holy Spirit as much as you should to be powerful. The Bible says some men have a form of godliness, but they deny the power. Some doctrines will tell you to leave the Holy Spirit alone, that that was for them back in the day, or it's not available for us today, but I'm here to tell you. Now, let me read this to you. Acts 2, 38. 
Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remissions of sins. So yes, you must be baptized. And it says, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So you need to do both of those. You ask Jesus in your heart. You're filled with the Spirit. You're obedient to show the world what went on in your heart. You make a public appearance to say that I'm going to be baptized according to God's word in the name of Jesus Christ. Acts 22, 16 says this. And now how are we? Uh, and now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized. Wash away your sin, calling on the name of the Lord Jesus. In Jesus, there is no condemnation for sin. Romans 8, 1. Therefore, there is uh, now no condemnation in. Uh, there is therefore now condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So if you're feeling uh, condemnation, see the the. The enemy will con will condemn you, uh, but the Holy Spirit uh, will guide you. So there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And that's what Bible teaching is all about, learning how to recognize what you're fighting, learning how to utilize the power that God has given you in your relationship with him to overcome the world. If you have religion and you don't have the Holy Spirit, you can't overcome the world because you're a, you're a, you're a compromised Christian and you're a carnal Christian. That means you know that you should be doing these things, but you don't have victory over them in your life. So let's move on. Romans 3.34 uh, says, Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So we're justified by his grace <clears throat> excuse me, through redemption in Christ. Now, that was the point one, is that I said all that and read all that to tell you that, that there is a deliverance from the guilt of sin. Now I want to talk to you about deliverance from the power of sin. So if you sin, you have a guilt. And that guilt will bring you farther from the Lord unless you press in and overcome the flesh and those guilts and having no condemnation in Christ and coming to him and running to him for help. And, and, and going. So the deliverance from the power of sin. Sin enslaves us, but Jesus provides freedom from the dominion of sin. John 8, 31 says this. Then Jesus said to the Jews who believed him. See, sometimes God is talking for his children and for those that believe him. Not necessarily for anybody. So when you come in and you think there's contradiction in God's word, it's because your flesh is calling out for what it wants and the devil is pushing you to find compromise, to think that God is not all-powerful and all-knowing, but he is. And when you go to God in that manner, you will find what you are looking for. Amen. So for them who believe, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. Where should Christians hang out? In the word. You'll be disciples, not just believers. See, we have a whole church full of converts and believers. They have no power because they have not been discipled. And so disciples need to be discipled. And that's what Bible teaching is all about. And you shall know the truth, verse 32 of, Rome, of John 8. And you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. How do you get free? By discovering, by being revealed the truth, by knowing more about Jesus, not knowing more about the world health societies or science in the world, right? So there you go. Jesus answered said, Most assuredly I say to you that whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son does. So don't be a slave. If, you're a, if you sin, you're a slave to it, but you are a son and daughter of the Most High because your sins have been redeemed by the bloodshed of Christ. And he's given you deliverance from the guilt of sin. And now we're talking about giving you deliverance from the power of sin. He does this through his spirit. John 7 verses uh, 37 says this. On the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out to them saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water but this he spoke concerning the spirit whom those believe uh, the, uh, of who of whom 
those believing in him should or would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. So once Jesus has been glorified, the first thing he did was send his disciples uh, to the upper room to get them filled with the Holy Spirit, which is the presence of God on their life, the gifts of the Spirit. And as, he, as they were filled with the Spirit, the church instantly increased. And from that moment until now, we've been living under the anointing of Christ and the power of his Holy Spirit. If you go to a church that does not give place to the Holy Spirit, I'm not just talking about talking about it. I'm talking about operating in it. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Now, you don't do things crazy out of hand, speaking in tongues. The devil has used this uh, for his advantage for so long. But it makes people run from spiritual things. How are you going to overcome your flesh without the help of the Holy Spirit? You must walk. You must ride. You must live in the power of the Spirit to overcome the flesh. So when Jesus was glorified, then these things would come to, upon you to him who believes. Do you believe? Then submit to Christ. Amen. So let's talk a little more about the deliverance that the Lord provides. We receive the Spirit when we are baptized. Uh, we, we talked about that. Acts 2.28. Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of the name of Christ for the remissions of sin, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. When the Spirit, with the Spirit's aid, so we need the help. We can put the deed, uh, put the death, the deeds of the flesh. Romans 8, 12 says it this way. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. If you're having struggles in your life, check your flesh. What caused you to get there? What thought did you allow into your heart? What did you see? What did you go after? The devil baits the trap with cheese. Usually it's fame, usually it's money, usually it's position. He plays on your identity. When he has nothing to play on, you are victorious. And so don't let the devil play on your flesh. Romans 8, 13, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if you live by the spirit and put to death the deeds of the body, you shall live. So on this present earth, we're learning how to be disciplined to overcome the flesh. When we get to heaven, we're not going to have to overcome our flesh. We get new bodies. We're grafted in to the family, and we're going to know how heaven operates. So to live is to be in the spirit. To die is a spiritual death in the flesh. Do not follow the ways of the flesh. Ephesians 6, uh, excuse me, Ephesians 3, 16 says this way, that we should, that he would grant you, put your name in there. That he'll grant you, Bob, Fred, Carrie, Amy, whoever, put your name. That he will grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. You see, your flesh is the shell, but your inner man is the soul, the mind, the will, and the emotion. Connected with the spirit of God, the spiritual man on the inside. So you have an inward man, and he's telling us right here, uh, in this scripture that we would be strengthened in the inward man now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us God has already predestined predetermined and delivered us according to his will Jesus dies for our sins as we repent of our sins then we can have a promise that he delivers us from an evil age and if there's ever been a time that we are in an evil age, it is right now. In Jesus, we are free from the law of sin and death. Romans 8, 2, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made us free from the law of sin and death. So we press into the laws of God, not the laws of man, not a global elitist, not doctors and scientists, not all these kind of things in such a way that is leading to damnation, separation, and to, to, to just Satanism. Because at the top of this, we are in a battle in this evil age between light and dark, between good and evil, between God and Satan. So choose your side that you want to be on 
And as you come in and enlist in God's army, you must rise up and be spiritually equipped, discipled to discern what times we live in. Because if you don't know where we're at right now and you've not been paying attention, then you can be defeated. Now, the Lord also provides us deliverance through the temptation of sin. We may, uh, we, we may logically assume that Satan will never stop tempting us by our fleshly desires. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the flesh has an appetite of its own. It likes what tastes good. It likes what looks good. It always thinks that the grass is greener on the other side. If I was over here, I wouldn't feel this way. The, the books tell us how we should look, what we should wear, what we should eat to be skinny. If you like, um, you know, all this stuff that goes on in culture. But again, I'm talking about the deliverance from temptation of sin. And Satan is never going to let up because Satan wants to play and to bait that trap in our life. Amen. So don't allow uh, these fleshly desires. Now I want to read 1 Peter 2.11. I'm going to read very quickly. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust, which war, which wage war against the soul. So when you're in inner turmoil, you're not having peace, you're not being uh, comforted, you're not embraced by, by God's love, you're, you're, you're just feeling rejected. You've got to look at the soul and you've got to say, is my appetite, is my mind being on the things of the earth? Because that will bring a war against your soul. We preach it every week. 1 Peter 5, 8 says this, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So don't let him devour your life. Be sober. That means don't be drunk. Be vigilant. Take, you know, redeem the time. Know where you're at. Jesus teaches us to watch and pray that we might avoid temptation. Matthew 26, 41 says this way, Matthew 26, 41, watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. God is telling us. God didn't say, I'm going to watch for you that you don't fall into temptation. He said, you must watch. Jesus already came and whipped the devil and sitting at the right hand at the throne of God. He leaves us on this earth to, to, to buffer us uh, against Satan, that we can know the word of God, that we can equip ourselves. And so he tells us, watch and pray, at least you fall into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. My point is, is Jesus isn't going to do it for you. You and I have to do it under the commission, the authority, and the submission of our relationship with God. If you don't have a relationship with God, you've been going to church for 30 years, and they don't teach on the Holy Spirit. They don't teach you the covenant of God. They don't teach you that you have spiritual gifts. They don't teach you much of anything except for three poem, three points in a poem. You need to be equipped in these end times. Get discipled. I'm asking you, be discipled. Know what you're up against because this will help us to overcome. Now, the deliverance of the Lord provides. You see, our Heavenly Father will not allow us to be tempted beyond what we are able to bear. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you beyond what you are able to bear. Uh, uh, it says, uh, being able, but that which is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with every temptation, he makes a way of escape. That escape is Jesus. You press into Jesus, you have an open door for victory. Or escape the situation that you are in. That you may be able to bear it. God doesn't take you out of every trial, every tribulation, every challenge that you find yourself in. He's, he's called you to go through that, that he will be with you. And he's strengthening us. So don't resist it. Learn from it. And allow Christ to be that. In every temptation, God provides a way of escape. In Jesus, the godly can find deliverance from temptation. 2 Peter 3, 9 says this, The Lord is not slack concerning his problem as some count slacklessness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all shall come into repentance. That's why the Lord hasn't returned yet. He's waiting for those that are lost to come to repentance, that they would not perish and spend eternity 
separated from him. And if you have been discipled, you need to quit being silent. You need to raise up and engage your culture and do whatever you do in business and in community and in politics, wherever you need to find yourself to take back this world, which is a dark world for the light of Christ. Amen. Deliverance comes from moral darkness of this world. Those enslaved to sin are in darkness and they've had their, uh, they've, they've been darkened in their understanding. Now I've got about 10 more minutes that I need to really read through this. And I pray that I can get through this message, even if we run a little bit long, but there's points that have to be made. So the moral darkness of this world, Ephesians, they've had their understanding darkened. Ephesians 4, 17 says this, I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the fertility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance, excuse me, because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their hearts. There you go, the inward man. When you sin, you get hard-hearted and you reject the things of God. But we see right here that they were darkened in their heart because of their ignorance and they have rejected God and they walked as the Gentiles. Do not walk as the Gentiles or the people in this culture without Christ. Christians should not be following the Christless, the Gentiles that have not known their identity in Christ Jesus. They're leading them right into the hospitals. They're putting them in bad medicine. They're just killing them off. And I want to tell you that we should be wiser than that. 2 Corinthians 4.3 says, But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled, veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds of the God of this age, who is the God of this age? Satan has blinded. Who do not believe, who were, who were blinded by Satan? Those that do not believe, right? Least the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God, should shine in them. So again, we're talking about moral darkness in our world, which explains the lawlessness and the greediness. For, uh, Ephesians 4.19 says it this way, who being past feelings, see your feelings do not determine who you are, what you are in Christ Jesus. You take your feelings, which is part of your soul, and you line it up to the word of God. And no matter how you feel, you give your brain the food of the word of God that says, I am an overcomer. I am worthy. I don't need to participate with these group of people to feel important or to feel special in the world's eyes. You are special in the eyes of God. Who being feeling have been given themselves over to lawlessness, to works of all uncleanliness and greediness. Man, if that's not a description of the headline news today with all... <coughs> With all these different groups fighting for their agenda? Where did this come from? Everything was at peace a year ago. Now all of a sudden we have major things in our front. But it's like bull riding. It's not what you did when you got bucked off. It's what you didn't do two jumps prior to that. Even in bucking horses or roping. You make a mistake here. It doesn't show up to two or three jumps down the road. Okay? So we've allowed this to happen. We need to fix this as God's children through the help of the Holy Spirit, through what Jesus has done on the cross. But Jesus reveals moral truth and how we are to be renewed in true righteousness and holiness. See that? We are to be holy as our Father is holy and in true righteousness, to be in right standing with your Creator, not worshiping the creation and trying to change the way it was made through artificial intelligence, through um, all these things that are going on in technology, all they're trying to do is replace God. I'm telling you, we cannot do that. Ephesians 4.20 says this, But you have not sinned, uh, not so learned Christ. So he's saying you have not learned Christ. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, then you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt, according to the deceitful lust and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you may put on the new man, which is created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. 
So God is saying, put off the old man, be baptized, bury that guy in water, come up with a newness of mind in holiness and in righteousness and in renewing your mind to God's word according to Romans 12 and verse 2. And in Jesus, light shines the moral moralis on the plagues of the world. See, when the light is turned on, the sin has to retract, the darkness. Will America rise up? Will God's remnant church rise up and turn on the light of Christ and go back to our fundamental teaching and save America? I'm asking us to do all of the above. I want to be a part of it. I want you to be a part of it as well. Amen. So we have just a few moments. John 8, 12 says this way. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. Who, uh, he who follows me. Uh, who are we following? We're following Jesus. We're not following the teachers of this present age. We're not following new age religion. We're not following hyper grace. We're not adding Jesus to our problems and then allowing our flesh to go back to sinning. That is not the gospel. Be careful who you listen to in their teaching. Amen. Uh, he who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. John 12, 46. I have come as a light into the world that whoever believes in me shall not abide in darkness. We're talking about deliverance from an evil age. We're talking about overcoming um, deliverance from the guilt of sin, the power of sin, the darkness, the moral darkness of this world. Let's talk about this world is passing away. This present age and the lust is passing away. 1 John 2.17 says this, And the world is passing away and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God shall abide forever. This is the point of today's broadcast is to get us serious about the deliverance that Christ has already provided for us. But he's not providing it by him just doing it for us. We must engage. We must be discipled. We must be renewed in our minds. We must take action against Satan. And when we have our foot on his neck, we must not let him up. And to revert back to our old ways, our old patterns of thinking, or our old flesh. Put him in his place. The day is coming when the world and its work shall be burned up. 2 Peter 3.10 But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt in fervent fire and heat, both the earth and the the works that are in it will be burned up. Everything that you value today, that you put your hope, your confidence and trust, is it, is it wood, is it stubble, is it hay? Whatever you put your trust in outside of Christ, your money, your status, your, your uh, identity, all those things will go away. Only what you invest in Christ shall remain. And you take that into eternity with you where you shall receive the crown of your works, your life on this earth. God wants to bless us. God is setting up this world for revival, and we need to be a part of it. Even if our life, even if we live out our lives, there is, uh, they are a monetary vapor. James 4.14, 4, for what is your life? Even a vapor that it, it appears for a little time, and then, of course, it vanishes away. So, our deliverance from this evil world may come in the form of our own death. Well, to be absent of the body would be to be present with the Lord. And that is where our inward man is going to live forever. And God predestined us. God knows us. God formed us. We should not allow the fear that the world is selling us to send us right into the pits of hell and put us in bondage. Isaiah 57, 1 says this, the righteous perish. And no man take it to heart. Merciful men are taken away while no one considers that the righteousness is taken away from evil. He shall enter into peace that shall rest in their beds, each one walking in his uprightness. That's a lot of things to say that even if it costs us our life, we shall live in Christ Jesus. Eventually we'll come at the deliverance from this passing away world will eventually come at the return of Christ. Now I'm drawing closer to the end of my message right here 
I, I don't know how we've made it. I know we've kind of rambled very fastly, but I am so thankful that you have stuck with me and that what we're teaching on is the truth and we're not going to reject the truth. We're going to receive the truth. We're going to meditate on that. And even if it costs us our life on this earth, it would be greater to gain the rewards of spending eternity in heaven rather than in the pits of hell. And some religions will tell you there's no hell. Some religions will tell you there's no rapture. You need to know what you know. You can't depend on today's modern teachers to lead you into victory because some of them have already compromised their faith in God and they're walking on an evil side of life. And so I want to just get that very clear. Going to church doesn't make you a Christian. It makes you uh, by label a Christian. But in order to be totally set free, we must know that when Christ returns, we will be like him. We will be in him. Listen to this. Only two scriptures, and then I'm going to bring it to a conclusion. In 1 Thessalonians 4.15, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that, he who, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. Meaning those who have already passed away, right? They're asleep. And then we're talking about us, those that remain at the coming of the Lord. Verse 16 of 1 Thessalonians 4. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will arise first. Verse 17. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Now I know this is a very meaty scripture, but I'm here to tell you that God, if you are God's child and you are in the family <coughs> and in God's army, he loves you. He desires to deliver you. From an evil age, which is the title of today's message. But there are things that we have to do, not in legalism and not in work, but out of righteousness and out of a love and out of a purity. If you want the fruit of the Spirit, you've got to meditate on God's Word. If you want to be victorious, you've got to fight this dark age that we live in. You cannot compromise and follow the Gentiles and do what they are doing. You cannot take that road back to Babylon in your finances, in your physical health, in your emotional health, in your mental health. You will be defeated to the point of exhaustion. You will be put in bondages and chains and led into slavery. My goodness, let's wake up and be Christians, not by label. Now, in Jesus, we have a promise from deliverance of every evil work. I'm bringing this to a conclusion. The last scripture that I will read to you is 2 Timothy 4 and verse 18. Then the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for heavenly for his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. So the Lord wants to preserve you and I, he wants to give us a hope. He wants to give us a future as we seek for him with all of our heart. Paraphrase Jeremiah 29 verse 11. So as we see this, let's press into the things of God. So let me summarize real quick before we pray. Even though we live in a morally confused and spiritually dark world, Jesus, in Jesus we find deliverance from the guilt of sin, deliverance from the power of sin, Deliverance from the temptation of sin. Deliverance from a moral and darkness of our world. And deliverance from a world that is passing away. We do such, uh, we note that such deliverance is according to the will of God. Where we started this journey in Galatians uh, chapter 1 and verse 3. It is the will of God to deliver you and I from an evil age. We have hope. Quit following the world 
and taking what it is selling and putting it in your body, putting it in your mind, allowing it to be present in your home through media content, you must guard your heart and mind for out of it flows the issues of life. Uh, we are sitting back and watching people be destroyed to the point of death and being led into darkness. It, it, it infuriates us that know who we are in Christ to see that, but we are always going to walk in love. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink just to bring it home to our, our audience of believers and cowboys and so forth. So according to the will of God, he wants to deliver us. Deliverance is his plan from the very beginning. Ephesians 1, 3 says, Blessed be the God, the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. If you're not in Christ, none of the scripture pertains to you, right? So verse 4, He, just as he has chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love having predestined us and adopted us as sons by Christ Jesus <clears throat> to himself according to his good pleasure of his will. God loves you. God brought you to this telecast this morning to be set free, to hear the truth of God's word. Amen. So it is his love that offered his son for our sins. It begins there, but it doesn't end there. Religion preaches you up to the cross and shows you Jesus hanging on the cross. If you believe in all these denominations and all these um, different belief systems, Jesus is not on that cross. He went to that grave. He ascended into heaven, and now he's making intersection for us. 1 John 4, 9. In this, the love of God was manifested towards us that God sent his only begotten son into the world that, that we might live through him over and over again in our identity in God's word. It's in Christ, in Jesus, in him, uh, in this love, uh, in this is love. Not that we love God, but he, but that he loved us and sent his son as a proportion, uh, preparation for our sins. How shall we respond to such deliverance? There was a ransom. Jesus paid. There is a reconciliation of man's heart back to God to receive the peace of God. You will not have peace in this world without a relationship with Christ. You will not have peace if you're following the Gentiles to Babylon. You will not have peace if you think that you can get a certain thing in your body that's going to make you go back to the way you were or it's going to defend you against something that we can't even see. And then we play with numbers and we put fear into our culture. We need to wake up. Shall we not glorify God by acceptance, accepting his graceful deliverance from this evil age? He makes possible through his son, Jesus Christ. We do so through obedience to the gospel. <clears throat> Man, I don't know about you. I know my time has gone a little bit over this morning. I pray that this teaching has revealed to you that there is a deliverance available to God's children. I want to be very clear. You cannot play games with God. I got so tired of playing cards with God. He knew my hand. He knew my heart. He knew my every thoughts. He knew when I was trying to be in the social crowd. He knew when I was doing things that nobody else knew. He knows that about your life. Come clean with God. Bear your soul to him. Get on the path of righteousness. Don't allow lawlessness and darkness and covetousness and idolatry and all these wicked perversions that you'll find in Romans chapter 1. Don't allow the world to push their agenda on us. Let's push our agenda on them, which is how America was built in the first place. God is looking, the world is looking at America. We were on the foundation of, of a covenant of Christ. And if we do not put him back in place, we will not have victory. Those of God's children will go to heaven, and I don't know what happens to all the rest, but I'm here with every waking breath in my body, the same way that every Christian should be a soul winner. 
and I need to put focus, we need to put focus on the truth of God's word in these perilous times that we live in. Not having a form of godliness and denying its power through hyper grace, <coughs> excuse me, new age religion, false teaching, false doctrine. Church is not in that building that you attend. Church is in your heart. And when you have two or three pressing in and praying in the presence of God, bearing your soul, showing your weakness to God, God will strengthen you. Amen. If you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, I want to give you the opportunity to do that right now in this broadcast. It is easy as A, B, C. Admit that you are a sinner. Believe that Christ raised God from the dead and confess your sins and under righteousness with your heart. Believe. It doesn't do good enough to just believe in Christ Jesus. We must submit and surrender to him. Will you pray this prayer? If you mean it with your heart, God will answer this prayer. Say, Dear Jesus, forgive me of my sins. I know that you have forgiven my sins through your Son, Jesus Christ, by the shedding of his perfect blood at Calvary. Father, forgive my sins. For I believe the word of truth that I've heard today. I ask as you forgive me. I also ask that you fill me by the same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from that grave. The Holy Spirit fill my life, fill my mind, and fill my heart. Lord, I thank you for the gospel. I thank you that you have given me a measure of faith. And together, with the help of the Holy Spirit, we will overcome and we will be delivered from this dark and evil age. I thank you that as you have forgiven my sins, as far as they are from the east to the west, that I can have a future and I can have a hope. Help me to forgive all of those who have ever wronged me. And help me, Lord, in my identity to be the one that you created me to be. Thus, I will ride on course with my destiny. I love you, God. Thank you for the gospel truth this morning. We pray these things and believe them in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. And all of God's children said, Amen and Amen. Well, I know we might have been over just a few minutes. I don't want to apologize for that, but I want to give you some information. Boy, we really went over. But listen, if you'd like to partner with this ministry, just simply type in westernharvestministries.com, scottmendes.com. We ask you for your financial partnership as we draw this year to an end. We're going to be rallying and, and bring in our year-end reports to show what we've been doing for you, our partners and friends. Listen, we love you. Until next week, remember, download our app at Writing on Course. Stay in touch with us. We love you. God loves you. And I pray that this message has encouraged you. There is deliverance and hope for God's children. We'll see you next week. God bless. I'm Scott Davis. Bye-bye.